Welcome back to ECE 441A, 541A. I have quite a few announcements, but a lot of them are probably good for you. In three weeks, you don't need to come to class. That will be engineer's breakfast, and maybe some of you will be there. I may be there, but homework three is due on Monday. Exam number two is, wow, in a couple of weeks. And lab number two will be due a little bit beyond that, 10 days after that. But we will be covering lab number two material on exam number two. You'll want to make sure you know the material in lab number two for exam number two. Homework number three, if you're struggling with trying to match your answer with what the figure says, don't spend too much time with that. They've mislabeled their iodine curve. It should be I divided by 10 to the 16 instead of I divided by 10 to the 15, but you should be able to get the same shapes that they have in their figure, but just don't assume that their labeling is correct on the graph itself. That's in the book. What I want to do today is have a matching quiz, and you'll do that individually and then as a group, and that's to prepare us for the Chapter 5 material, which is trying to get us ready to feel better about making this connection between the complex frequency plane with our pole locations and what that corresponds to in the time domain system response. And this is going to be due for a, or we're going to set up this relationship for a second order system. And that's what we'll discuss then in the last half of the class, which is this relationship between these pole locations in the S-plane or the frequency domain and the transient response. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this quiz, but here's what I want you to do. There's going to be three questions. And what I want you to do is tell me which of these pole patterns connects with the appropriate time response meaning pole pattern A, I've tried to highlight in blue, does that go with step response 1 or step response 2? Does pole pattern B go with step response 1 or step response 2? Obviously, you could finish this quite quickly if you had a coin. You could make a coin flip and you can decide I or 1 or 2, but I want you to try to think which one is it. Which of these pairs is it? Is it A with 1, B with 2, or is it A with 2 and B with 1? And the strategy for that, I guess I didn't tell you what we were going to do strategy-wise. I want you to think about that individually. Here's the rules of our matching quiz. And then convince your neighbor in 60 seconds. And if you're doing this at home, you can talk to the mirror convince your reflection that what you're saying is correct. And they may argue back quite heavily. Let's go back to the quiz. You now have less than 30 seconds to make that call, and we'll have three of these. So write down your answer, and if you're in agreement with your neighbor or friend, then discuss why you felt that your answer was the reason, or why, what the reasoning was behind your answer. Go. Everybody has it? So now start talking to your neighbor about which one is which. And write down your answer because we'll be asking you in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> 
That's question one. Write down your answer and we'll move on to question two. What? Well, write it down because I'm going to ask you as a class to tell me what your answers were. So remember what your answer was. You do not have to turn this in. Here's question two. Yes, I said quick. So think about it for 30 seconds and then share with your neighbor. All right, you can start sharing if you weren't already. I don't see any coins. That's good, right? You're not guessing. Are we ready for question three? Here's question three. And my two is dashed to try to be consistent with that figure. If you were wondering, I'm really trying to be very careful with how I'm color coding these polls and responses. Everybody, I think, has settled on an answer. Let's record your results. And to do this, what I will do is I will ask you to show me one or two fingers at the count of three, and I want you to give me your finger in front of your neck. Or, yeah, don't get... Maybe, I, well, yeah, one or two. Hopefully you can show me one or two fingers. One or two fingers. Make sure you get your one finger correct. It's the index finger. If you're playing at home, just show me a finger. One or two. And at the count of three, question one, one, two, three. We're doing question one. Now I'm confused. I'm counting wrong. But I saw quite a few twos and some ones. Did I not? But I think this was maybe the majority. Question two. One, two, three. This one's about split. This is equal. Of course, this is not an election poll, so don't hold me to these results. Question three. One, two, three. Everybody's feeling peaceful today, or most everyone on question three. This one seems to be the majority. <laughs> 
Now, how did you go about classifying that or making those connections? You just tried to make the connection. But what have we learned so far? Yes, Solomon. Actually, let me just go ahead and write that down. So you're saying something about the imaginary axis. It tells you if I said this, what would you tell me is happening above and below that dashed line? What happens or what characteristic are you suggesting is connected with this vertical distance away from the real line in the complex plane? It's the damping or how much it's oscillating. Actually, this one's oscillating. Which one's damping? What do I, how do I draw a line for damping? The further we are into the left half plane, the larger that negative number in the exponent's going to be. Damping is influenced with how far we are into the left half plane. Oscillation is how far up we are in the vertical direction. That's our damped frequency of oscillation. That's omega sub d. And do we have something else that we can think about? Yes, if I drew this and said, what's the radial distance? That would be our natural frequency. But here I'm concentrating on the angle theta. What's the angle theta give us? What property of the system response? That was connected to our damping ratio, ratio zeta, which was associated with this angle theta, and that gives us our PO, per percent overshoot. What we're going to do is try to make these connections, these relationships, more intuitive. And we're going to do that by walking through some of the equations that connect these complex pole locations to their performance in the time response. So you were looking at, if we talked about settling time, which one of those is dealing with settling time? Of these three up here, oscillation, damping, and percent overshoot, which one is consistent with settling time? That's the damping. The further you are into the left half plane, what's the settling time? Bigger or smaller? Smaller. The percent overshoot? Is this angle theta? And then the peak time is one way that we have thought about this Nat or this damped frequency, omega sub d, and that's our imaginary component. So the peak time, how quickly you get up to your maximum value, is associated with how far away your poles are from the real axis in the vertical direction. And that's what's going to be critical is making these connections in chapter 5. And chapter 5 is now getting us, once we establish these connections, we can be using those connections to help our design. And that's what a lot of students want to do. They want to design. So now we're going to get to that capability as we learn chapter 5 material. And let me tell you how we are going to do that. This analysis that we're doing is going to be based on ivory soap. No, 
but ivory soap is what, 99.9% .9 pure? We're going to be using pure two-pole systems. That's the connect. You don't need to remember that. But now you'll remember when I say pure two-pole systems, that means we do not have any finite zeros in our transfer function. And pure means we only have two, pure meaning no zeros. Our analysis will be based on a transfer function that is on a pure two-pole system response. And before you start thinking, well, that's not going to apply to my system. I have a fifth order system or I have a sixth order system. The nice thing is a lot of this behavior is actually captured by just looking at a second order system. A lot of higher order systems actually start behaving like just a second order system. Many higher order systems have a response that is similar to a two-pole system. And let's just look at what that or how this might actually arise. So here's an example second order system which will we will create by relying on some of the quite a bit of the material that we've already talked about. Suppose this is now our plant or system. What could that be? What have you seen that has this kind of a transfer function? Do you remember? Did we derive, I think one of your homework problems was deriving maybe a first order but that was assuming maybe that we didn't have the position information, but you could think of this as a DC motor. This is a model of a DC motor, a generic DC motor. We are actually going to interconnect that in our classic feedback structure and now we want to find, and for all of you that are texting this later today, you can just say CLTF and you'll know exactly that that means the closed loop transfer function. All right? So now you can quickly text. Twitter apparently is experiencing difficulties, but this wouldn't eliminate too many of your 140 characters in a Twitter. Contemporary issue, I guess, as far as what you need to know. What is the closed loop transfer function? What is T of S? Which is this ratio of output to input. And it's Friday, so that means we're probably cheering. Which cheer is this to give us the closed loop transfer function? Cheer 2. G over 1 plus GH. What's H? 1. So now we have G over 1 plus G. H is 1. And if we clear the fractions, we will end up with K over S times S plus P plus K. And this now, if we multiply it out, there is our pure, there's no finite zeros, there's no values of s in the numerator that cause that transfer function to vanish. And we have a second order denominator or a two-pole system. No finite zeros. And two poles. And we won't be talking about individual 
transfer functions, we are going to describe this now in a generalized notation. Let's now look at describing this pure two-pole system in more standard notation that you might see in many textbooks or articles. Our T of S is now going to be S squared plus 2 zeta omega sub n s plus omega sub n squared. And if I want a DC gain of 1, what do I need the numerator to be? And this is a gonna, going to be a pure two-pole system. If I want a DC gain of 1, what needs to be in the numerator? Omega sub n squared. And that's a constant. where our damping ratio is zeta and when you see zeta you need to be thinking about the angle those poles make with the let's say horizontal negative horizontal axis that's consistent with zeta and we are also describing this with omega sub n our natural frequency and where do you find the natural frequency in our closed loop pole plot. What's our natural frequency? How do we identify that? If I sketch two complex conjugate poles, pardon? It's the hypotenuse. You should be seeing right triangles. And the hypotenuse is the distance from the origin to those poles. That's our natural frequency. What's the opposite side or the imaginary side? Omega sub d, the damped frequency, and our, hor our horizontal, that's sigma, that's our damping, which is zeta omega sub n. Now, we want to find the poles of this transfer function described in terms of this parameterized form, zeta and omega sub n. And you should all still remember your quadratic formula with the coefficients a, b, and c. This denominator is what's one way of describing with an adjective this particular denominator. Do you remember? M m monic, it's been normalized to 1. So now our a is 1 and we want the poles of that we want the poles of our transfer function. And we can find those by just applying our quadratic formula, which is negative b minus 2 zeta omega sub n plus or minus the square root of b squared, which in this case will be 4 zeta squared omega sub n squared minus 4a times c. So now we have 4 omega sub n squared, since a was 1, and we divide by 2a, and a again was 1. There are now our two poles associated with this transfer function written in a generalized form. And we want to clean this up a little bit or make it a little bit more compact. One way is to divide the 2 out, get rid of the denominator. So that we now have minus zeta omega sub n plus or minus, we can divide that 2 out because we have two 4s in that expression underneath the radical, and this now becomes the square root of zeta squared omega sub n squared minus omega sub n squared. Pardon? We can pull out that omega sub n squared, can't we? We can go ahead and pull that out, and now we have minus zeta omega sub n plus or minus omega sub n square root of zeta squared minus 1. But we actually are interested in 
these two poles when they have a complex component. And to have a complex component, we need that radical to be negative, don't we? So we're looking at complex poles. Uh, see, it's a pole. It's infinitely long. I did that on purpose. I wish. I have no idea why it decides to clown around with me. Oh, I shouldn't be mentioning clowns, should I? Let me erase that. Might have security here in no time. Here's our complex poles. If we restrict our damping ratio between 0 and 1. So this is our damping ratio. And if we make it less than 1, then we have our expression that we're after. Minus zeta omega sub n plus or minus, we factor out a minus 1 from the radical, that gives us a square root of minus 1, and we now have j omega sub n, and we've now reversed the order of 1 and zeta by factoring, or zeta squared, factoring out that minus 1. There are our complex poles, and there's two of them, and we can now sketch that in the complex S plane. What's the real part of our poles? If I put poles right here, maybe I shouldn't have made them so symmetric, but I did. What's this distance here? The real part of those complex poles? minus zeta omega sub n, and we've collapsed that zeta omega sub n to be sigma. So this, we could say, is sigma, which is zeta omega sub n as a distance. It's negative. That's why we're in the left half plane, but we're worried more about the distance. We also have the hypotenuse, which you told me is the natural frequency, omega sub n, and we can also find the damped frequency right here. And that's the omega sub n square root of 1 minus zeta squared. That's the imaginary component in that complex number. That's the vertical distance. We obviously have the twin downstairs. That's the minus j, but we're just talking about the upper. And we have the horizontal distance, sigma, which is zeta omega sub n. And we will be talking about theta throughout this discussion. And theta is just that angle, which is really purport or related to this fraction of adjacent over opposite. Or we might think of the cosine, and then we're talking about the adjacent over the hypotenuse meaning cosine of theta is sigma, which is zeta omega sub n, over the hypotenuse omega sub n, which is zeta. And that's our connection between the damping ratio and that angle. And we can get one from the other depending on what we are given in our problem. If somebody gives us the poles, then we can figure out the damping ratio. If somebody says, oh, we have a particular percent overshoot, we can back out the zeta, and now we can find the angle that those poles are making in the complex S point. We want to now relate that to our time response trajectory or picture. So let's say that is now our output response, y of t, in this second order pure two-pole system, we could define several values on here. Let's say this is where it eventually settles. I'll call this y steady state. What's this vertical line now signifying or representing? That's the peak, so we'll call this y peak. 
and we're interested in the time that it takes to peak. We can also look at this distance, and that's related to our overshoot, where we calculate the percent overshoot. So we take y peak minus y steady state divided by y steady state times 100. That gives us our percent overshoot. What else do we have? We also have a Let's just assume that this is our 2% 2. And we are interested in when we enter into that 2% 2 tube and never leave that 2% 2 tube. And what does that give us? That gives us our settling time. And it's actually a 2% settling time if it's in a 2% 2 tube. If it was in a 1% tube, which would take longer, then it's a 1% settling time. But this textbook likes to use the 2% settling time. And that's actually four time constants, four tau. 1% is five tau. And we'll show those values. It's just an approximation. A lot of this is just giving us sort of a rough feel for what's happening with our dynamic system behavior. You also might have somebody talk to you about the rise time. And sometimes that might be, how long does it take me to first get to my final value? And this then would be T sub R. And if you don't have overshoot, how do you measure rise time? Well, you might measure it between 10% of your final value and 90%, and then you would consider that little piece your rise time if you have an overdamped system. Is it clear what we now have labeled on this graph? If I now give this on an exam, which I did on exam one, you can pull off all of this material or information to find a transfer function. So the question is concerning the 2% tube, and when do you decide when you've reached inside that tube? I just sort of like to think of, I don't know, the tube that I'm most familiar with is a toilet tube, but you now have this toilet paper tube, and you want the first time that it gets into that tube and never escapes. It doesn't have to be a full period. It's just when do you first get into that tube? Obviously, you get into that tube back here, but you don't stay in that tube. So it's when you get into that tube and never leave. It doesn't have anything to do with what happens period-wise before or after. It's just when do you first get into that tube? And obviously, if you're eyeballing this on a graph, that's very subjective. But you can sort of guess, OK, I'm within 2%. Boom, this is my settling time. That help answer your question? Now, what we want to do is talk about connecting this picture in the time domain with this pole pattern in the frequency domain, which requires us now to look at the time response In our case, that's the output y of s, which is t of s times r of s. We want to make this fairly generic, so let's just consider our input to be a unit step. And I'm assuming that you all have this memorized, y of t Where's y going to end up? If we put in a unit step and this is our transfer function, where do you expect to end up? What was the DC gain here? 1. How's the DC gain impact your final value? It's going to scale your final value. And you put in a 1. So now 1 times 1, you should be going to 1 in this case. So y steady state is 1. 
we then have our expression for y of t is 1 minus 1 over the square root of 1 minus zeta squared e to the minus zeta omega sub nt sine of omega sub d, which we will write in terms of the natural frequency and the square root of 1 minus zeta squared, or damping ratio, plus theta. And we can derive that, and I think it was derived in the lab number one notes. So you can now just inverse Laplace transform that standard form and get this, where now the angle theta has an inverse tangent of opposite over adjacent, which is omega sub d over sigma relative to our poles, or that's this inverse tangent of omega sub n square root of 1 minus zeta squared over zeta omega sub n. We can cancel out some common terms in the numerator and denominator, and we end up with the inverse tangent of the square root of 1 minus zeta squared over zeta. Another way of computing theta, the angle. What we want to do now is make these connections, and that's where, or that's what we are calling now, these design specifications. Or these are locations for dominant poles in the S-plane. And I may be talking about dominant poles a lot. What do I mean by dominant poles? Have I mentioned that before? If you had four poles, we're just dealing with the second order, so the dominant poles are the two poles in our transfer function, but if we had a tenth order system, the dominant poles would be the poles that are closest to the origin, that dominate the response, that are the slowest ones to respond. And typically, the dynamic behavior is going to look like this second order system. So let's now look at these design specifications in terms of S-plane pole locations. We want to be able to find regions in the S-plane that we can put our dominant poles to produce the performance, time domain performance, that we want. Let's look at the 2% settling time. That might be a design specification. Somebody might say, I want this to have all the transients gone after a second. And now that informs you as to where you need to place your closed loop poles in your system. If we go back to this, what influences how fast we decay in this expression for y of t? Which term or terms or pieces of that expression influence the decay? Zeta and omega sub n, right? In the exponential term, e to the minus zeta omega sub n t. So our decay envelope is influenced by e to the minus zeta omega sub n t. Or we might just collapse zeta and omega sub n into our distance into the left half plane, and that's our sigma. Or somebody might write that as e to the minus t over tau. And in this case, tau, which is 1 over sigma, is this 1 over zeta omega sub n. But what do we know about the settling time? We know that in terms of tau, don't we? If it's a 2% settling time, T sub s is now 4 tau, which is 4 over sigma, which is 4 over zeta omega sub n. 
And that's now our relationship that we want. We now have related. If somebody gives you a settling time, you can back out the distance into the left half plane. You need your closed loop poles to live in or be in that region. So the damping tells you how quickly your transients decay. And now if you put on your two-year-old hat and you said, why? Where did this come from? Then if we look at e to the minus zeta omega sub nt, which is e to the minus sigma t, which is e to the minus t over tau, well, at a time t sub s, t of 4 tau, what does that mean? That says that we have e to the minus, and now we substitute t, or replace t, with 4 tau. And you all have e to the minus 4 memorized. Yes? Maybe not? Hmm? But you can guess. You know it has to be close to 0 0.02 if we're calling this a 2%. But e to the minus 4 is 0 0.0183, and that's where our 2% settling time is coming from. 4 tau gives us 2% because that's our decay envelope, and we're getting within e to the minus 4 in that long of a time, and that's then this 2% 2. How can we use this in a design problem? Suppose somebody says, I want a settling time less than one second. Well, we've just derived this relationship. We know our 2% settling time is 4 tau, and that's the same as 4 over sigma, and we want that to be less than 1. And I hope with all your higher order math skills, you can solve this for sigma. <clears throat> right? That's why you spent three semesters of calculus and a semester of DIFIQ so that we could solve this inequality. <clears throat> Sorry, just had to put that in there. But now what does that imply for sigma? Sigma, sigma needs to be bigger than 4. So that if we were in the complex plane, now we can march over here to minus 4. We can draw a vertical line and we say, you know what? As long as you give me poles over here in this shaded region, maybe here and here, that's going to be satisfying my settling time specification. Those are supposed to be complex conjugate. They don't look like they have the same imaginary component, but they are supposed to. This is our desired region for these triangles or the dominant poles. Is it clear how you can now use a settling time spec to inform your decision as to where you want to locate your closed loop poles? If I now said the settling time is a half of a second, what's going to happen to this red vertical line? If I want a settling time, a 2% settling time of one half of a second instead of one second, which way is that red line going to move? We need our system to be faster, don't we? So the red line is going to go to the left. It's going to be at 8. So we would need our poles to be to the left of minus 8 for a one-half second, 2% settling time. Let's look at the next design specification, which is peak time. From our y of t expression, when do we find the peak time? Or how do we find it? 
now we do need to get our calculus book out, don't we? When did we find mins and maxes? First semester calculus, we were differentiating and setting that first derivative equal to zero. So the peak time has been determined and you guys are telling me that you, by your response, that you really worked on lab number one. Lab number one was doing most of this in terms of finding that G of S. The peak time is determined when the time rate of change of the output is equal to zero. It gets up and then it's coming back the other direction. And we want to find that for the first time after the trivial case, which would be the trivial case when that derivative was zero, when we're starting at zero, is zero. So we want to know what's happening after time t equals zero. And if we do the analysis, we find that the argument of our sine function is omega dt, and we set that equal to pi. That's the first time after t equals zero when the sine argument is zero. And we know that omega sub, d t, omega sub d can also be written as omega sub n square root of 1 minus theta squared t if we wanted to. So we can now solve for the peak time by saying that that's pi over omega sub d or it's pi over omega sub n square root of 1 minus zeta squared. Where did the pi come from? The oven? No. The pi actually came from looking at y of t, differentiating that, and now what falls out is a sine expression. And we do the sine of a plus b, and then we evaluate that, and we end up with a sine of omega sub dt as one of the terms and we're setting that equal to zero, that means the argument omega sub dt needs to be pi. So now let's look at how that translates into an example. Here's our formula. We've now derived two formulas, one for settling time and one for peak time. Here let's say that we want a peak time less than one second. Our formula says that our peak time is pi over omega sub d, and we want that to be less than 1. Again, we need to solve this inequality, and we have omega sub d is now greater than pi. And this is why we needed to learn where omega sub d lives in our complex s-plane. What kind of a line do I need to draw to represent omega sub d, vertical or horizontal? Horizontal. So now I'm here, and I would want this distance to be pi. And I now want my dominant poles to be above that. I need omega sub d to be bigger than pi, and this is now where I would locate my dominant poles is in this shaded region. And I haven't said anything about how I need to settle in this one particular design spec. I just gave a specification on the peak time. But to do peak time and settling, do you see I would now have to take the intersection of this vertical line and the horizontal line. So here is the desired region. And we have one more design spec. And since there's no class at 10 in this room, we can just keep going, like the Energizer Rabbit, right? We'll just go, uh-oh, until we have to update our Microsoft Essentials. Percent overshoot. Now we are evaluating this at time when we peak, 
we'll find the peak in terms of zeta and omega sub n and we'll solve that in terms of damping ratio and relate this damping ratio. This is now going to give us an angle and if we want a particular percent overshoot, now when I start thinking of angles and wedges, I'm thinking either of a pi, but that'll get confused with pi, so I think of a pizza. So now to get less overshoot, we want our angle to be smaller. And we'll pick up at that point on Monday.